both hemispheres of this large round form have spent the day, has spent 24 hours in the damp room. Now it's leather hard, which is stiff enough to hold its own shape, but still malleable enough to be joined. Um, but before I put this, before I turn this over to assemble the two, I need to make a chuck, which is the word for a nesting place for the lower half so that it'll remain centered and affixed while I um, join the two. So I've weighed out eight pounds of the same kind of clay to make the chuck. Now, um, there are, well, I, I won't go into that. I'll just do it the way I always do it. So I'm thinking of questions students would ask right about now. Um, Mr. Thiel, how do you keep the clay chuck that you're making, how do you prevent it f f from sticking to the um, lower half of the pot that you've thrown? Um, I'm noticing that I picked relatively stiff clay. If you use really super wet clay to start with, it's going to be sticky. So I've used a stiffer clay, um, which is harder to throw, but it's uh, easy to remove the unwanted additional moisture that might cause it to stick to the form that I'm gonna put inside. Now the next challenge, oh by the way, I've opened it all the way down to the wheel head. So um, this chuck is going to be, it doesn't have any clay on the bottom. It's just the bare wheel head. And <clears throat> this inside curvature needs to be similar to or wider than the base of that, the bottom half of our, of our project. So, so this chuck is different from the chuck you made for trimming mugs. Um, and, right. The, the trimming for mugs is uh, inside that the mug sleeves over. This chuck is on the outside that the, that the pot nests into. That's good. That's a good point. Um, in the bottle assignment, the students usually use a already made chuck that's been bisque fired. Would you grab one of those and we just show them what that looks like? Thank you. Okay, so I'm looking at the bottom of the dome that I made and making sure that this opening is big enough. This is an example, this is, this is, this is clay that's been bisque fired, so it's porous. Um, when the students make a bottle, this is often uh, fixed to the wheel, and then the bottle is put down in there like that. And so that's what we call a pre-made chuck. I, I personally don't like these <laughs> because I can never get them to fit right. Uh, and I don't usually work at this scale. This, this is the size I usually work. And there aren't any big chucks <laughs> in the class. Um, so now that I've opened this uh, large enough for the base, now I'm going to use my metal rib on the straight side of the rib to uh, scrape away any of the unwanted residual water that I used to center this and shape it. And while I'm at it, 
I'm going to try to do a what's a good description of, of this? The negative contour. I'm, I'm trying to imitate the negative contour of the positive shape of that bowl. Would you recommend to your uh, first time students doing a, using calipers? Yeah, the th thank you. The thing about production potters is that they've trained their eye over time with practice. And I can just look at that and see that it's big enough. But if you're doing this for the first time, you're going to be challenged. So this caliper has two uh, distinct uh, sides. The C-shape side is for measuring the exterior uh, outside uh, measure for a lid or a foot. Here, I, could, I, could, I would measure this too. Notice that I've made the opening of the top part generally the same size as the foot. That's a kind of ideal proportion for large uh, round forms. Now, I, now that I've measured the outside diameter of the bottom or foot, I'm going to use this measure on the inside of the chuck to make sure I've got it large enough. So let's come on over here to the wheel. And as you can see, the opening is slightly larger than the uh, foot, which is going to accommodate uh, the form and it'll nest down in there real well. So while we're here in this position, I'm just going to lay that down in there now. Okay. Before I put this in the damp room, I ran a wire through to uh, cut the clay off of this wooden bat. Uh-oh. Doesn't feel like it wants to come off, so I may have to do that again. Actually, I don't want to use the wire. Uh, another way is to use a needle tool. Uh, yeah, the needle tool is... I'll, I'll just go a second time with the needle tool. speaking, clay doesn't like to join, um, let's pretend this is the top and the bottom hemisphere. Clay doesn't like to join what I call a butt joint um, because it's not enough surface area. Clay likes to be overlapped like this. So what's needed is a bevel on the inside of the bottom and a bevel on the outside of the dome so that when they come together, they come together like this and see how much more, you'll see how much more surface area the clay is able to join. Now to get to that point, um, I could take my needle tool and just uh, eyeball a 45. You, you know, the, the, this is a 90 degree angle. We want a 45 degree angle. This tool has been designed. It's a, there's a wire there's inside a right angle that makes a 45 degree cut. This has been designed for this sort of thing. Um, we'll see if it works for this. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do it progressively instead of all at once um, so as to keep some resemblance of control over it. Now the first thing I need to make sure of is that this thing is centered. It's close enough. 
it appears close enough. Do you could, could do, you also use your, a trim tool to make that angle, although um, exact? A trimming tool, if you don't have something like this, a trimming tool would work too. Anyway, it, lo logic tells me that if I keep this uh, vertical, I'll get the, 40, the desired 45 degree angle. And if I do it progressively, then it won't, it's less likely to grab and uh, pull away more than I want. Okay? So you're saying, what you were just saying, is that another way to do it would be to use a trimming tool like this, but now you would have to be pretty good at judging what a 45 degree angle looks like. So again, that, that would depend on the, how trained your eye is, okay? Now in a similar way, so you're gonna be wanting to turn the camera. In a similar way, I'm gonna want to um, make a 45 degree cut here. So um, what I've done to make that work is uh, basically the, it comes down to body mechanics. Notice that I've elevated the dome using this banding wheel to the point where my arm just naturally comes down at a 45 degree angle just by positioning the pot here below my belt line. I'm just naturally going to hold the tool at that 45. I don't even need to eyeball it. I'm just, I'm just going to let my body mechanics uh, rule here. Is and, it possible to do the same thing on the wheel? Um, mm, I guess if you, if, well, at my studio in Oakland, I, my pottery wheel is on a scissor lift, which makes it possible for me to raise and lower the wheel uh, so that I can throw standing up, in which case I could adjust it to that exact height. Yeah, these wheels aren't like that. Okay, so this should, oh wait, wait, before I do anything, I need to score. Um, the landing place. Got a bunch of debris down in here that I don't want. If you get a bunch of clay in a, where you don't want it, what you do is you wad it up and use it like a clay magnet. Yeah, like that. That'll pick up the other scraps. Yeah, it's like a scrap grabber. Otherwise, you're going to have debris down in there that you don't want. Okay, so scoring tools. Yeah, you could use your needle tool to score, right? But that's a really fussy, uh, labor-intensive, time-consuming way to do it. Instead, you're going to want a uh, scoring tool like this one, this one's missing a tooth, which is, makes, makes it much more efficient. And there's different sizes and shapes of these kind of to scoring tools at the clay supplier. Now also notice that the, the angle that I'm scoring is at a diagonal. It's not going with the contour or directly against the contour, it's at a diagonal to the contour, like that. And when you're scoring, you're not, you need to dig in like you really mean it. I've seen people watch me do it, and then when they do it, they just make this little mark. I guess they're somehow worried that they're going to hurt the clay or something. No, you need to get in there and really dig, because that's where the water's going to go that's going to create slip and join the two parts. So it's really important that you, you know, be aggressive in the scoring deep enough. 
Now, with the other side, it needs to be scored too. So the first thing I'm going to do is flip this over and remove this. There's debris in this part too. Unwanted debris here too. I need to get rid of. I'm not really trimming this, I'm just getting the debris out of the way. The just leftover, unwanted. Clay in the way. I'm just getting clay in the way out of the way. So again, I'm going to want to score at a diagonal to the contour. And when I score, I want to dig in like I mean it. And then I have a choice between spraying water with the spray bottle right into this or using the uh, handle slip. Um, I've discovered that just if I score deep enough um, and in a uniform way, it's enough just to put water down into the scored area. It'll, it'll join, it'll create its own slip and it'll join just fine. So that's what I'm going to do. But I, oh, here. So I've got it on broadcast, but I put it right down where I want it. More is not better when it comes, to, you'll want to direct the water right into the scored part. Okay. And here. So Mr. Thiel, couldn't you use a wet sponge to put the water in there? Answer, yeah, you could, but what's going to happen is the sponge is going to actually smush the uh, scored troughs or marks uh, shut. You want them to be open receiving the water. So the spray bottle is the preferred conveyance for the water. Okay, we're ready. Now I've made this rim beefy enough or thick enough that it can hold its own shape when I do this, all right? If you make a really thin rim, this is not going to work. So notice that I've got my head right over the top of what I'm doing so I can see all the way around uh, as I lower this on here. Now, the apex of the curve is obviously at the equator, um, but notice that it's w actually wider. Uh, it, it's not really round. It's kind of a, uh, <laughs> I don't know what kind of shape to call that. So it's, it's, it's going to involve, um, I'll probably need to paddle this. So. Um, if you put if you put the uh, wheel in neutral, um, it will turn freely like a banding wheel. So what I'm going to do now, treating the wheel like a banding wheel, is I'm going to start to paddle this seam. And since the since the cut that I made isn't a butt joint. The cut that I made is a miter, like this. As I paddle inward, that actually increases the overlap rather than shifting off like if it was a butt joint. So here's another important reason to cut the parts at a 45 degree angle.
way. Ooh. And I want it to speed. I don't want it that fast. There we go. Wow. That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> I need a bigger hammer. Let me uh, try the shortest one you got there. The, the, the short one. Because it's got, the, what I like is it's got the most heft to it. Okay, so I need to get back into neutral. This is done in small increments? Yeah, the... The technique with a paddle is um, it's, you're, I'm not hitting it hard, I'm just hitting it the same, keeping the same amount of strike, striking it the same way all the way around. So it's, it's really the important thing to, th to think about is uh, uh, applying the paddle in as, as, as uniformly as possible. Um, the actual tempo uh, is up to the individual. If, if you think you can uh, control the paddle uh, with a faster beat, uh, then go for it. Uh, let's see. What else? Um, in terms of body mechanics, notice that I've got my I'm sitting on the stool with my body tilted to over at an angle and back. So I'm over and back uh, where I can actually see what I'm doing. Most um, beginners doing this make their mistakes when they can't see what they're doing. You need to get your, bot get your head over and back far enough to see what you're doing. I'm actually pinching the clay. Yeah. And while I was doing that, I was thinking um, the clay is actually softer on the inside just because it's on the inside than it is on the outside. And that's making it, uh, that's, that's preventing me from like really throwing effectively in the traditional way. But this, the clay is, is the thickest right here at this join. So one way to rectify that unequalness would be to pause, spray this, and put a band of flan wet flannel along, you know, cut a band of wet flannel about an, three inches, stri a three inch strip and just lay wet flannel on there for about 10 minutes. 
and that would soften the clay enough to make it equal on the inside and the outside that would enable me to throw more effectively. I'm going to demonstrate how you can apply flan wet flannel to the outside of this round form where here at the join and the aim of that is to get this clay the same wetness and pliability as the clay on the inside so that I can actually throw the contour uh, rounder. So it starts by taking flannel. Um, this flannel is not terry cloth, flannel is not linen, flannel is not uh, a t-shirt. Flannel is flannel, <laughs> okay? Uh, most of those uh, plaid shirts are flannel, okay? Uh, this is bed clothes. And notice I've made a strip about three and a half inches wide. Now I'm going to get them wet and wring them out. And then I'm going to also get the pot wet. And the reason why I need to get the pot wet is so that this will cling to it. You want it to cling to it thoroughly, like a wet t-shirt. I'm only, I'm only going to apply flannel where I need it, which is right here at the equator. More is not better when it comes to applying water on your project at this stage. You want the water just where you need it. Otherwise, you're going to make a mess, and things are going to start sticking together. Okay, notice how I'm not letting it bunch up anywhere. I want it to be um, stuck to it as thorough, as, as, as uniformly as possible. Now, the next thing to say about flannel Flannel is a lot like aspirin. Twenty, say two aspirins will cure your headache. Twenty will kill you, and it's that way with flannel. Um, a short amount of time uh, with the flannel stuck to the pot will get it the moisture just right. If you, you know, put this on, cover it up, and go do something else. Uh, like go to lunch or something like that and come back, this will have gotten too wet. So as soon as I apply this, I look at the clock. And 15, maybe 15 minutes is all it needs to get this soft enough for the, to, to continue uh, throwing. Okay, so it's been long enough now um, that I can remove this. How's the sound? Good? Okay. Now, the, the clay on the inside is just as plastic as the clay on the outside, which will enable me to pinch and pull and form this area at the equator so that it was to make it rounder and the wall thickness is more uniform. Right now, the clay is really thick here at the equator.
Boy, what a difference a few minutes with the flannel can make. Look, it's, it's clay's made much more plastic now. And so I can get my form a lot rounder at the equator. Okay, I'm satisfied that I've made it uh, rounder. The, the actual apex of the curve is slightly above the equator, which makes it seem to lift it a little bit more. Uh, when round forms have the apex below the equator, they, they seem to feel like kind of dumpy, like uh, gravity has had its way. If you can get the apex above the equator, it feels more like a hot air balloon. It's, it's like it's inflated. So if I did my homework, getting the chuck dry enough, this should lift right off. We'll see. How about that? Okay. So notice that I grabbed it below the um, below the equator because the clay's. If I grab it here, the clay is so plastic it may change the shape, change it in a way that I don't want. <laughs> 